very, very warm welcome to all of you. It's nice and cool in here, isn't it? Coming from outside, many on the bike, like I am, I did, so uh, I, I like being here. Yeah. Um, well, this is going to be an afternoon with uh, superstars like Dan Ariely and Jaap Seidel and, and more and more um, on, um, well, how can we change the behavior of people in a way that they make wiser choices for, in this case, healthier food, maybe. That's what we're going to be discussing the whole of the afternoon. And this has been organized, I can say, quite last minute and quite well by the Joop Lange Institute. So uh, first, I'd like to uh, give the word to Marlene Hendricks. Please join us. And an applause, please. Yes. <laughs> welcome. You're the director of innovation. And uh, so uh, the welcome word, obviously, is to you. Yes. Thank you, uh, Esther. Um, so on behalf of the Jupplange Institute, um, I would like to welcome you all to this event. Um, for some of you may think the Jupplange Institute, Healthy Living, Amsterdam, how does it work? Um, we have our roots in global health. Um, we work in different countries across the globe. And what we see everywhere is that health systems are under pressure. So people live longer almost everywhere, but not necessarily in good health. And there's incredible, uh, an, an incredible epidemic ongoing of lifestyle-related diseases. So things like obesity, hypertension, diabetes, give complications like strokes, heart disease, kidney failure. And there's just not enough money and there are not enough doctors to treat all these patients. So, for example, there are over 1 billion people with high blood pressure worldwide. And if all of these people would go and see a doctor now and be treated uh, according to the current guidelines, there wouldn't be a single doctor left to treat, let's say, a patient with HIV. So, something has to change. And healthy living can save lives. It can prevent people from becoming a patient. And for certain patients, uh, for example, people with type 2 diabetes, uh, changing their lifestyle drastically can completely revert uh, their disease and actually taking away the need to take drugs. But well, that's easily said and done uh, because I think we all know uh, that changing uh, your habits is not that easy. And especially in an environment that constantly seduces us to buy healthy st uh, unhealthy stuff like junk food and drinking soda. So. There are a lot of things that need to happen. We probably need much more regulation. Maybe Absadel will say something about that, but the UK recently introduced a sugar tax. Um, we probably also need a complete different way of financing our systems with much more focus on prevention and not only on curing diseases. But all of these things are not gonna happen overnight. And today we wanna focus on what we can do now. How can we make a start in shifting from disease management to health management? And again, coming from global health, we learned from the HIV epidemic that even when problems are huge, just starting somewhere and with the private sector can actually help to catalyze change. And there are a few opportunities that we think are very promising. So we all know that there's a huge revolution with mobile phones and technology ongoing. And this revolution created an enormous amount of data that can be used to understand and influence human behavior. Even the US elections we've seen. Um, but you could also use uh, these data to support people in health management and uh, support people in making more healthy choices. And the second thing we see is that the private sector is realizing that they have a responsibility here. And that more and more companies are looking for way to, uh, ways to align their business interests with social impact. And for some it may be a bit sensitive to work with the private sector. Because some may say, well, they are the enemy, they caused this problem in the first place. But we strongly believe that joining forces will actually uh, help to create a much bigger impact. So today we bring together experts uh, on healthy living, on behavior, both from the public and private sector. And we hope we can discuss with you how we, how we can create uh, business models that are actually around a healthy lifestyle. And I'm looking forward uh, to the discussions. Okay, thank you so much. Marlene Hendricks. Yes, and as Marlene explains, we are going to start with uh, three wise men, uh, and they're going to be uh, introducing us to the wise behavior in the context of food. Uh, so it's Dan Ariely, Jaap Seidel, and uh, Arnoud Verhoef. I'll introduce them to you more extensively lately, later. And we're going to try to kind of build a business model. And the thing is always, I'm sure that if I would go around now and ask you, do you have a good idea? What should we do? We have many 
plenty. And when we were discussing this day, we said, I'm sure we can get idea number 1261 and 1262 and 1263 because we have the under 1260. We have them already. But the thing is, how will we get things going? And there's something there about demand and supply and financing something where all the everything that's to be gained is in the future, but the costs are now. So it, it's difficult. Um, and today is also good. So, so we we chose for this special way of doing it. Will we, we will have three experts uh, who will be coming up shortly. And then there's two parties here later that are really trying to do things now, to change things now. And basically, the way of thinking is how can, what can they improve and maybe what can we improve and learn from all that. So um, our first expert then, uh, I'm sure at least the Dutch people know him, but I'm pretty sure in the international world he's also quite well known. He's a distinguished professor at the VU, VU University and VU Medical Center in the area of health, food, obesitas, but also behavior and much more. That's the first new book of today. There'll be more. Uh, the book is Juggling with Food. That's the English translation. But, um, uh, so now I forgot the Dutch word. What is it? Jong leren met eten. A book that's not only fighting food myths, but also telling us the real story. And he's an advisory of many, uh, both local and national governments. Can I have an applause, please, for Jaap Zedel? Thank you. Uh, I was asked to really set the scene a little bit of what we are really talking about, and it, it's always uh, good to start with the, uh, with the overview, I guess. And um, I've been working in the field of non-communicable diseases for the, the past 35 years or so, and it, it's really now a problem that we no longer can uh, ignore uh, that will cripple our societies. That is uh, actually the title I gave, uh, I invented a new one on the, uh, in the tram here is it, it's the only affordable scenario we have for healthcare in the future. And I will explain why. <clears throat> so we are dealing with uh, non-communicable diseases, which are no longer a problem of the uh, affluent societies, rich societies, mm -hmm. as we are living in here. 80% of the people dying from non-communicable diseases live in low and middle income countries. <clears throat> But it is a, a, a severe problem also uh, here. These are the four categories of the major non-communicable diseases. And uh, we do a pretty good job in trying to treat these people because we can afford it. And we can also <clears throat> treat their risk factors. This is what we call prevention in our system of healthcare. That means four million people chronically are treated with antihypertensives in this tiny little country with uh, 16.9 uh, million people. Uh, one, point, one million, uh, a little bit over one million, have, have two type, type 2 diabetes. Uh, 1.5 million are treated with uh, statins, uh, and 1.5 uh, million people are chronically treated for depression with medication. <clears throat> so we are pretty uh, good in finding individuals with high risks and treating them. But this costs a lot, and I will explain how much that is uh, in, a, in a moment. We know that 80% or more of all of these diseases and risk factors are caused by unhealthy diets and lack of physical activity, uh, high consumption of and harmful use of alcohol and tobacco use. And to make it a little bit uh, broader, also we know that pretty much all of these behaviors are collectively caused by all kinds of social determinants. Uh, living in an urban area, uh, having poverty, having ha food insecurity, uh, lots of stress and um, uh, other problems that we are uh, dealing with. These social determinants are usually not touched upon because they are not seen as a part of uh, health and health care, but they should, and I will explain uh, why. So how are we doing with obesity globally? This is the, the latest figure from the World Health Organization. We're doing pretty much in reducing uh, undernutrition malnutrition. <clears throat> and this is what uh, it uh, is the parallel increase in obesity worldwide. So we are starting about the time that I started dealing with this problem. And my mother always tells, since you have been starting meddling with it, it just got worse. <laughs> so this is what we, uh, this is when I did my studies and this is when I started research and then, you know, th this is what happened. But it's staggering. It, and this is projecting, it's not just because you ha we have a lot of obese children, but this is a, a um, uh, foreboding of all kinds of non-communicable diseases that we will see in the future. 
So uh, these are the social determinants. I'm not going into detail because there's a lack of time, but th these are really the problems that are causing this obesity epidemic worldwide. It's not lack of control of eating behavior. It's not uh, uh, laziness and, and uh, poor choices that people make or small children make. It's the environment in which they are growing up uh, that is really uh, what we call now an obesogenic environment. And that includes also urban slums in a large part of the major cities in uh, low-income countries. And this is just a figure of what we are dealing with. This is only the Netherlands, but just to give you an idea, we have 16.9 million people and we have around, I must see, look at the number, 8.5 million people with chronic conditions, chronic diseases. That's half. That will not get better. If we, if we follow all the projections, you can't see it here, but these are all the increases that we uh, are expecting in the coming years, partly because we are getting older and, because, uh, and also because we are getting uh, a, a larger population, but predominantly also the percentage of people with chronic conditions and illnesses will go up. These non-communicable diseases will affect a great number more than the, we are now. And that probably means that three quarters of the population will be treated by one quarter of the population, something like that. You know, that's the scenario. <clears throat> um, Health inequalities, this is also, I, I apologize for the Dutch slide, but uh, you can get the gist here. This is the life expectancy of people with high uh, levels of education. Uh, we should say now in the Netherlands, theoretical education, uh, because we cannot say high or low because that's discriminatory. But anyway, they have lots of years of education uh, and they live uh, until the age of 86 or so. And their uh, chronic diseases start at the age of 72, on an average. And look at the people with um, more practical education levels. Uh, they live six years shorter, uh, but their disease period already starts in their early 50s. So it's about 18 to 20 years longer of unhealthy life years. These are all these years that you are coping with your diabetes, with your uh, arthritis, and all kinds of other uh, chronic problems that uh, require medical care, but they also uh, have a lot of impairment of quality of life and they are leading to lots of other things like loss of productivity and uh, uh, all these all other societal aspects. <clears throat> so what does that mean for a rich country? So let alone for countries that are grappling with their economies and have very poor healthcare systems. This is when, uh, when uh, a few years back, uh, around 4% of our gross national product was uh, taken up by uh, medical care. Uh, that's now 12% and it's projected, these are official data from our government, that in the year 2039, which is not a really long way away, uh, it's about 20%. 20% of our gross national product will go into healthcare costs. <clears throat> uh, and that's more than five times relatively, more than we are covering now. But what does that mean for our country and our way of life? Well, this is what the projections are. So we, you see a lot of uh, uh, little things here, but here are the healthcare costs. So they are expected to increase uh, gradually and, and quite rapidly. And here are some other costs that have to do with uh, healthcare, like the BZ. I don't know the translation, I apologize. I maybe there is none. Uh, but take, take uh, into account what's happening here. So social security, education, we can no longer afford education and social security in the future because of the low high costs of healthcare. Uh, because of all of these crippling conditions, we will not be able to uh, educate our children and future generations. We will not be able to give them the social security that they will need if, if, if necessary. Uh, and that is going to be a disaster. We're going to live in a completely different world because of our healthcare problems. <clears throat> So what is the solution when I was trained in the 1970s in, in, in public health? This is, was the ideal, compression of morbidity. So that means uh, uh, this was 1900, so only a few people, you know, a few percent, were living at the age of 75 or so, and that has increased rapidly. And we want to, to li have more people living uh, longer, <clears throat> but also then to um, have fewer health, unhealthy life years. 
so to keep people healthy as long as possible, preferably in their 80s or 90s, so they are productive, they are participative, they are having a good quality of life, etc., and then die suddenly of a chronic disease that doesn't really extend healthcare coverage for the next 30 years or so, uh, that is an ideal situation that most people will like. We've interviewed people and that is said, I want to have a, have a happy, healthy life as long as possible and I die quickly. No, no long periods of disease with therapy and all kinds of other things and, and limitations and uh, all these other things. That, that is the only affordable scenario that we have. But what we do are actually, uh, when we do prevent diseases, we are just postponing these costs because they will come anyway in the last three, five years of life or so. Uh, and that's something we have to deal with, keeping people as healthy as long as possible and then have them a very short disease trajectories is sort of the option that is uh, affordable. Uh, is that possible? Can we postpone or prevent diseases? Well, this is a World Health Organization data. You can see here, this is, these are these problems again. And it's estimated and quite well uh, um, uh, underpinned by a research is that 80% or more of all of these premature heart disease, stroke and diabetes cases can be prevented. Uh, do we know this from um, uh, actual research? Yes, uh, you don't have to look in the detail, but there are lots of disease, uh, lots of projects, major projects all over the world, China, Finland, US, and, and other places, the Netherlands also. And by just simple interventions in high risk groups, you can postpone or you can de de reduce the risk of type two diabetes by 60% or so. That's an amazing amount. That's very cost effective. You know, it's easy to do. You can postpone diabetes or prevent diabetes for at least 10 years with simple lifestyle interventions. If you do it more intensively and if people lose a little bit more weight and they're getting really active and they really are, you can prevent almost all of them. Uh, so that's been shown also in sort of uh, dose response uh, studies that if you really can get people to help, to change their ways of life into healthier habits, you can actually uh, reduce uh, type 2 diabetes incidence by almost 90% or so. Uh, when people have diabetes, like we already have 1.1 million people with type 2 diabetes and all over the world, I think it's now 360 million people with type 2 diabetes. Um, is that difficult to treat? Yes, very costly and never, nobody gets ever better from medication and from long-term uh, monitoring of their disease. Uh, but there are some uh, studies that have actually looked at healthcare. This is just one example of a, a friend of mine, Mike Lean in Glasgow, and he did a simple open label study in primary care. Very simple, very cheap. And what he uh, uh, achieved, you don't have to look at the detail, was published in the Lancet is that with a simple, uh, <clears throat> a simple intervention, you can actually have almost 50% of the people with type 2 diabetes in remission. That means no requirement of medication, no further uh, limitations and uh, no medical care necessary. Uh, in the control group where they had intensive treatment and guidance, it was only 4%. So yes, we can uh, promote uh, health by an extending healthier lives, but also with people that have diseases, lifestyle can have a major impact. These are all the major risk factors for an ill health in our populations on the world, on a world scale, and they're all behavior related. Sorry, I'm, I'm almost done. So, uh, what, do we, what do we know? I mean, this is all problems, right? So, and, and some solutions. Uh, there are reports from WHO ending childhood obesity, but all there are other, and this is one of McKinsey, where they've calculated all of the solutions that are uh, evidence-based effective. This is the cost, what they care, this is the impact they have, and they are nightly, uh, nicely listed. And when I was advising the Minister of Health on the prevention accord, which is now uh, in the making, uh, I, I just put to, to them, you know, we know everything. Uh, this is, needs to be done. We've already signed all the World Health Declaration sort of uh, aspects of things that need to be done. We just now have to implement them. And it's necessary and urgent that we do so. So the conclusions are um, our NCDs, if we carry on as uh, usual, will cripple our society. No education, no social welfare, um, and no, no uh, arts and all kinds of other things. Uh, compression of morbidity is the best scenario that we'll have. 
uh, and it endures also, ensures solidarity and reduced health inequalities, which, which are now increasing all the time. And investing in prevention through promoting healthier behavior in supporting and enabling environments is essential. Do we know how to do it? Yes. Can we do it? Yes. Are we doing it? No. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Yep, you can go back there, but you can also take the first seat. No, you'll wait for the other experts. Okay, can we do it? Yes, but how? We'll talk about that later. Uh, good, so our next guest, um, is there anybody who doesn't know who Dana really is? Okay, good. <laughs> I was going to say world famous scientist. Uh, he tells us everything about how totally irrational we are. Totally dishonest sometimes. Um, and he doesn't really seem to care because he can even make something out of it and use it uh, to still make a better world at some times. Um, so that's uh, what we're going to be talking about with him. Please join us. Yeah, applause please for Dan Ariely. Welcome. Thank you. And as I said, you are here to promote your book, aren't you? Um, I'm, I'm here for multiple reasons, including that. Including that. It's about money, so we won't talk about, about it. Yes. But, uh, so there's an, and I also saw well, you... We just mentioned money, so we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll we talk, will a little bit talk about, about, about money. Um, I tried to get into it, but it's still in beta. You also have an app, a new app, Ariely in your pockets, or Pocket yes. Ariely. Yeah, yeah. You want it to be in people's pockets. Yes. Yeah. And so I downloaded it, and I wanted to go in and said, no, we're still in beta. We won't let you in. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll work we'll on this. I'll, 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 I'll get, okay, you, I'll get you in. Good. Well, you're a behavioral economist. That, that Those are the only economists who think irrationality exists. So that's good. They talk about the real world. I'm the old-fashioned one. I think it doesn't exist, or at least that I don't. Yes, you of course uh, But then yeah. I read your book, so I'm completely lost. Please uh, give Thank us you. your speech. Thanks. Okay, so uh, thanks, for, thanks for coming. And uh, I want us to think uh, for a few minutes together about behavioral change. And think and reflect about what should we be proud of. So you know, we've tried lots of behavioral changes in, in Western society. And can you think about something that we've been successful at? Something that we could look back and say, my goodness, we've been great. We reduced something by a dramatic percent. Lots of people are acting differently. Can, can you come up with some examples? Smoking, a great example. Smoking is amazing, right? We cut down smoking in the US from about 40% to 20%. How much is it here? But similar? Similar? Now, what caused, <coughs> what caused the reduction, this dramatic reduction in smoking? How much of it, you think, came from the little warning that says, be careful, smoking is dangerous for you? How effective was that? <laughs> Not effective at all. In fact, in fact there's, a, there's a study that showed that in the US, where they had a big sign with Marlboro in that particular case, and they did not have the warning, and then they added the warning, more kids smoked. Why? Because all of a sudden, uh, it was rebellious, and it was effective for them. What did happen with smoking? What did help? Part of it was taxes. Taxes made a difference. But the biggest effect came from the term secondhand smoke. Now think about what is secondhand smoke. We have to agree that the term secondhand smoke is a vast exaggeration. Right? We now look at people who are smokers as, as people who are killing us. Right? I mean, it's adding something to the environment, but you really need to be in a restaurant all day, on a flight the whole day to have the effect of secondhand smoke. But what did we do as a society by calling something secondhand smoke? We villainized the smokers. We changed their social image of themselves. They were not just smokers, they were killers. And now we could send them outside of buildings, we could tax them, we could do all kinds of things. So the point I want to make, this is an amazing social change, very little of it came from information, a lot of it came from taxes, and from villainizing smokers. What else? What else should we be proud of? Sorry? Reducing poverty, that's not an individual behavior. I'm looking for something that we do on a daily basis, that you would say, every day people are making better decisions now than they used to. Sorry? Oh, brushing your teeth? Brushing your teeth is amazing, right? Um, if you came from outer space, and you looked at people, and you say, 
What organs do people care the most about? It's teeth, right? What else do you care about and you deal with twice a day? Right? Teeth are amazing. Uh, people seem to care much more about their teeth than their livers, for example. How did we get there? How did we get there? What was it that caused it? Yes. A big part of it is about social acceptability. When you wake up in the morning, you don't ask yourself, are my teeth going to be healthy in, in 10 years? What are you asking yourself? Am I socially acceptable right now? And you come up with the conclusion that the answer is no. And you say to yourself, what do I need to be socially acceptable? And you say, I need mint. I need to be freshly minty smelly. And how do I get mint? Toothpaste. So this is an example, by the way, of a principle we call doing the right thing for the wrong reason. We brush our teeth not because we really care about our teeth, but because we want to be socially acceptable. So we do the right thing, it's great to brush our teeth, but for the wrong reason. By the way, the toothpaste, inherently, is not important. But it causes us to brush our teeth. So the health benefits are not there, but the real benefits come from the fact that they sustain the behavior. <clears throat> Another example of something we do quite well is putting our seat belts on. And this is again a, a really interesting behavior, but we put our seat belts on because cars beep, and tax and uh, fines, and also with seatbelt you have a physical feeling that you have, and by the time you start wearing your seatbelt routinely, you feel something is missing if you don't have it. But if you think about those examples, and by the way, there are not that many examples of something we should be proud of. If you think about those examples, the point is that information alone does very little. That in, in our history of humanity, most of the changes came from something else. Villainizing, fines, social acceptance, something very different, and something that comes right now. Not something that comes in the future, but something that comes right now. Now, when we're going to come and think about how we're going to change behavior, the, the basic strategy that we have is tell people. If people are not doing the right thing, let's just tell them. If people are eating too many donuts, let's just tell them this is unhealthy for you. <clears throat> so we did a study recently with a group of um, diabetics. Type 2 diabetics, uh, about 2,000 of them. And we, we tried to figure out, this was a representative sample of diabetics in the US, and we tried to understand what is, what is causing them, what, what correlates with A1C under control. What, when do they have high A1C and when, is, when does it get under control? And we said, do they know what they need to do? Do they know that they need to take the medication, exercise, eat something different before they exercise, something different after they exercise? Do they know that they have to take the medication, check their feet? The answer is they know, and that level of knowledge doesn't predict level of A1C. Okay, so knowledge doesn't seem to predict anything. And then we said, okay, what about knowing the risk? Do they know how bad it is? to be a diabetic, uh, they could uh, get amputation and uh, blindness and so on. They don't perfectly understand all the risks, but their level of understanding of the risk doesn't predict medication adherence and doesn't predict A1C. We said, but what, what about motivation? There's this notion that people are kind of going on a journey. In the beginning, we don't really care, then we're getting ready for a change, and then we really are kind of into an action. It's a very famous uh, model of motivation in health. Turns out, you look at the people at the different levels of buckets of motivation, doesn't matter at all. What do you think matters? It's not knowledge, it's not knowledge of the risk, it's not knowledge of knowing what to do. It's not um, <clears throat> motivation. It, yeah. Community? Interesting. Um, it turns out it's something called breakpoints. Now, think about the life of a diabetic. The life of a diabetic is highly, highly regulated. You have to think about your disease all the time. You have to think about what you eat and what you drink and when you're going to do it and when you're going to exercise and what you eat before and what you eat after and when you're going to take your medication and when you're going to check this and if you're a woman you can't wear high heels. Lots of things happen at the same time. All your life is regulated. And then on top of that, people have other things. They fight with their significant other, they have unexpected bills, all kinds of things happen. And from time to time, 
we just have enough. We get to this level that you say, excuse me, this, fuck it. Right? You get to a level where you say, I can't handle this anymore, and then what happens? Fried food, chocolate, high calories, dessert. And that's basically the pattern that we see. And the only thing that predicts A1C is how often people experience these breakpoints in our data. Now, this, by the way, also suggests that if you think about the slide that we saw earlier, that we have to think about the person as a whole and not just as a patient. Because as patients, they know what they need to do. It's just that life is becoming so taxing and so difficult and their financial stress is so high that the answer for stress is cookies. And cookies basically uh, decrease uh, or accelerate their diabetes. So, so the point is that information alone is not helping and we really have to think about people's, people's environments. And I want, to give you about, uh, I want to give you two examples of uh, cases where this, I think, has worked out on scale quite, quite well. The first example is from a company called Discovery Health. And Discovery Health is a, a health insurance company in South Africa. Uh, one of the benefits of being a health insurance company in South Africa is that there is no privacy laws. So they can find out lots of things about their customers, including what they eat in the supermarket. So you're, if, if you're a patient of Discovery Health and you go to a supermarket, Discovery Health knows every item that you purchased. And by the way, they give people 20% back on the healthy item that they, that they buy. Um, not too long ago, they introduced a new incentive plan. Oh, and what they do is they give people points. And you get points for doing medical exams, and you get points for running, and you do all kinds of things. And those points are fun to collect, but they added something different, which they gave people now a free cup of coffee every week if they stand to some regimen, a certain number of uh, walking and eating and so on. They have a, a combination of things you can do, and you can get a cup of coffee a week. By the way, it's not good coffee. It's, like a, a, it's not like a high-quality chain. It's a low-quality chain. People love that cheap coffee because it's free. Um, but, but what's so nice about it is that it has cadence. And if you think about our behavior, how do we get people to behave better? What is absolutely clear is we need to get better habits. If every day you, walk, you wake up and you say to yourself, should I behave well or not, many days you would decide not to behave well. But if you basically get into a habit, it means you don't ask yourself the question. What should I do today? You just have a habit. So they took the incentive, which is usually a long-term incentive. I, I want to be healthy at age 80. And they said, that's not motivating enough. Let's give you a free cup of coffee, <laughs> bad coffee, once a week. And that turns out to be much more motivating and much more in the service of creating a healthy habit. The last example I want to give you is to say that sometimes information does work, but we have to think very carefully about how we give it. Uh, so we did a project in which we try to get people to lose weight. Right? That's a good thing to do. Um, and we, we said, okay, if you think about the social, as a social scientist and you wanted to get people to think about their health, how would you start? So imagine you're a social scientist and you ask yourself the question of how do you get people to start thinking about health? Or, or let me ask the question differently. What is about your environment that already reminds you about health? The scale. Right? If you think about your home, the refrigerator is kind of a mixed signal, right? Some healthy, some not. If you have gym equipment that you don't use, it reminds you about health, but not everybody has those. Um, the bathroom scale is an amazing thing. Right? Um, if you have an app on page four of somebody's phone, that's not very exciting. But if somebody gives you two square feet of their home, that's an amazing thing. Right? So we said, okay, let's think about the scale. The scale is something that people see usually more than once a day. So we said, what do we know about this scale? And we know three things about this scale. The first thing we know, it's a really good thing to stand up on a scale every morning. Not so good to stand in the evening. Why is it good to stand in the morning? Not because we weigh less, we do weigh less, but if we stand on the scale in the morning, we remind ourselves that we want to be healthy. And then we eat a little bit less for breakfast. If we stand on the scale at night, we just go to bed, by the morning we forgot the whole thing. So it's good to stand on the scale every morning, point number one. Point number two, weight fluctuates. Weight fluctuates a lot. Um, 
you know, skinny people, weight fluctuates two or three pounds a day. Obese people, weight can fluctuate eight pounds a day. Now, think about somebody who doesn't change their weight on average, but weights fluctuate. Let's say up by a kilo, down by a kilo, up by a kilo, down by a kilo. What is the psychology of that experience? So we have something called loss aversion, where we hate losing more than we enjoy gaining. There's something non-symmetrical about this. So in weight, of course, we hate gaining, we enjoy losing. So but think about somebody up a kilo, down a kilo, like this all the time. What's the psychology? High misery, slight enjoyment. High misery, slight enjoyment. High misery, slight enjoyment. What's the average? Bad news. Think about it yourself. How many of you have a scale at home? How many of you are looking forward to stepping on it tomorrow morning? Very few. Very few. Um, th I know there's, a, there's like an S&M community. In, um, <clears throat> anyway, but no. No, seriously. I mean, very few people enjoy, enjoy it. For most people, it's just an unpleasant experience. And the last thing we know is that people expect their body to react very quickly, not just to weight, but to other medications as well. So people say to themselves, I've been on a diet since yesterday morning. I ate nothing yesterday, I ate nothing today, and now I step on the scale, and I went up by 0.7 of a kilo. And then you do it another day, and you all go up by 0.2 of a kilo. And then you take a day off. And now you go down a little bit. Think about it. If the body reacts in a delayed stochastic way, and our model of the body is that body is a deterministic machine that reacts very quickly, there are going to be mismatches because of that, and we're going to get discouraged and confused. Now think about those three facts. Good to step on the scale in the morning, gain aversion, and we're not used to, and we're not reacting well to delayed stochastic feedback. How would you solve that? We decided to create a scale with no display. So we said, if, if stepping on a scale is a good thing, let's create a scale with no display. And when people step on it in the morning, we say, congratulations, you've done your job. You stood on the scale. That's good. And then we said, let's give people feedback. Of course, feedback is good. But let's not give them the feedback on a daily level. Let's give them the average over the last three weeks so they don't get the fluctuations. <clears throat> and then we said, you know what? The average of the three weeks is fine. But in health, we almost never celebrate nothing bad happened. The reality is that nothing bad happened is great news. But, but our psychology doesn't categorize nothing bad happened with good news. So we said, let's not give people the, the weight in pounds or kilos. Let's give them the feedback in a five-point scale. And let's take a whole standard deviation in the middle and say, congratulations, you're just the same. Nothing happened. Slightly worse, much less, slightly better, much better, five-point scale. And it's a running trend of the last three weeks. And, you know, in, in many ways, we have this quantified self, um, I don't know what, trend. But what is data really for? Is it for historical accuracy? Or is it to help people understand the relationship between cause and effect? For us, it's to help people understand the relationship between cause and effect. And if something is not helping us understand that relationship, let's not show it. By the way, uh, imagine that you have a woman, and she's on her menstrual cycle. Should the scale tell her that she gained weight? The answer is absolutely not. It doesn't help you understand the relationship between cause and effect. Imagine how difficult it is to be a woman, to stand on a scale and say, my weight went up by 0.7 of a kilo, but on my second day of my period, so let me deduct 1.2 from that. Why, why should people do this, this exercise? Anyway, so we created this scale with no display, five-point feedback scale. Here are the results. We went to a group of low-income obese people, some of the hardest people to change their behavior. Some people get a regular scale, and for the duration of the experiment, five months, they gain 0.3% of their body weight every month. Some people get our scale, and those people lose 0.7% of their body weight every month for five months. Now, there's something I really love about this. What I love about this is that as a social scientist, you can come to almost any instrument we have at home and say, how have we designed that? In the case of a scale, we used to have a scale, and there was a real reason to have the display on top of the scale. Then we moved to digital, and what did people do? Say, instead of this thick needle, which actually didn't show us all the variants because it was so thick, we never really knew what's the exact weight, let's put the same display there and let's put two decimals, or a decimal, on it. That's not the right approach. 
Now we have digital, lots of new opportunities are coming, right? Should we separate those, right? Should we separate the act of measurement from the act of feedback? And let's think about what kind of feedback actually helps people to learn. So in summary, let me say the following. I worry that a lot of what we try to do in preventative health is to give people more brochures, right? It's just to give people more, more information. And I think the efficacy for that is clearly not, not there. I do think that we need to become more interventionist. I think we need to uh, start uh, being more opinionated. We need to penetrate people's home. We need to change people's environments. And, and only if we do those changes, right? If the scale is in people's home. There's something about it that reminds them every day about what, what they want to do. Without those environmental changes, I don't think we're going to get uh, much further. I think we need some, some substantial changes. And then let me say one more thing. We created one more app. Um, it's a little turtle, a Tamaguchi. And the turtle is happy as long as people exercise, take the medication, and eat well. And the turtle becomes less and less happy as people stop taking the medication, exercise, and eating well. And we know exercise from the phone. We know taking the medication from an internet-enabled pill box. We know their food from pictures that we ask them to take. And of course, they can lie a little bit. But the turtle starts happy every morning. And then when people don't behave well, the turtle gets upset, sad, gets in, into its shell. Um, and a turtle by itself does very little. I wish it did, but it doesn't do much. But what our turtle does is to delete other apps from the phone. So when we first, <laughs> when we first install uh, the turtle, um, we analyze what apps people use most frequently, and those apps are the first ones to go. <laughs> and people get to lose their apps every day, and they show up at night, and they get to lose them again, and so on. Now, the reason I'm pointing this out um, <clears throat> is that this, I think, is a really important question. It's the question of how paternalistic are we willing to be? This app is a very, very aggressive app. I don't think everybody should have it. Right now, we're giving it to patients who had heart surgery. And we, by the way, you can't uninstall our app, right? So we give them the phone. We get um, uh, permissions to control their phones. And, and we said, look, this, you're going to be, get released out of hospital. And in two weeks, you'll be really tempted to eat fried chicken and not take your medication and so on. If we install this app now, it will help you. It will protect you. And people want that. And then they get stuck because you know, they, they have this app on the phone. Um, now, I, I, I'm not doing it easily or lightly to be so paternalistic and, and heavy handed. But, but I want us to think about how much free will uh, do we want to allow people to have? Uh, because the more free will we allow people to have, the more tempted people would have. The world is full of temptation, and temptation is getting better and better. Right? Donuts are better now than they were, better in the sense that they are more tempting than they were five, five years ago. So, so we do need to change people's environments, and I think we have to think very carefully about how paternalistic uh, we're willing to be. That's it for now. Less free will. We'll talk about that. Um, our next guest, Arnoud Verhoef. He's uh, manager at the GGD, the Dutch Public or Amsterdam Public Health Service. Professor by special appointment at uh, UVA Uni University of Amsterdam. That's the other one. Uh, and he's in the board of Safati Amsterdam, which is a scientific institute specialized in research for healthy living. Please, a big applause for Arnoud Verhoef. Thank you. And well, actually, I'm here uh, as stand-in of uh, the elderman of uh, care here in Amsterdam. Uh, so I will uh, share with you some information about the present politics on public health here in the city of Amsterdam, with the ambition that Amsterdam would be or will become the most healthiest city in uh, the world, or one of the most healthiest cities in the world by 2035. Um, as maybe all of you know, in the Netherlands, public health is the responsibility of both uh, the national government and the local government. And uh, the local government, every four years, has to set up a public health policy plan and uh, also uh, prioritize the uh, um, 
public health issues aligned with uh, actually the public health situation of the local uh, population. For Amsterdam, the priorities uh, at the moment, and there is just a new city council installed last week, and they launched their uh, program, their general program for the four years, including some issues on public health. And overall, it's decreasing health disparities in the Amsterdam population. And inspired actually by this figure, which is the same Jaap already uh, presented, but just uh, in another way, that they realize here that there is a, a gap, a real big gap uh, in health disparities in healthy life expectancy and in life ex uh, expectancy overall and the city council say actually we can't accept that. Well, that was already earlier, uh, um, so, and uh, with the former uh, uh, city council, and they really started on, uh, launched a big pro program on Amsterdam healthy weight uh, among children, and that started in 2013. For that, uh, the mission is a healthy weight for all children here in Amsterdam by 2033. That's actually the, the children born from 2013, they should grow up in a healthy situation. The vision is this healthy weight is a collective responsibility um, and the healthy choice should be the easy choice and a healthier behavior in a healthier environment is the strategy. So this program is launched uh, or carried out since uh, 2013. And the leading principle is, and that's quite exceptional for local policy on public health, it's a long-term program, so really it stretches out over at least one generation. Uh, it's sustainable, uh, it's inclusive, all people and uh, are needed actually. Uh, it's learning by doing, it's a very complex wicked problem, so we don't know exactly what to do. Uh, making choices, focusing on efforts, especially on the most deprived areas and uh, people at risk. And uh, prevention first, but also, of course, having uh, uh, care for the children who are already obese. Well, and maybe some of you know this, recognize this, the, the rainbow uh, model by Whitehead and uh, Dahlgren, that's actually uh, indicating that all, everyone, all the different, uh, um, uh, not only uh, the individual people, but the surrounding, the physical environment, social environment, all the different policy uh, departments within the city, local level, national level, are actually needed to make a difference, which makes it, of course, also very complex. Um, apart from uh, a healthy weight, in the new policy uh, plan, the one launched last week, uh, there are a number of new uh, priorities set on uh, public health. Um, especially healthy and safe start for all newborns in Amsterdam. That's not only about uh, healthy weight, but health in general. Uh, with the focus on the first thousand years, so actually in healthy pregnancy and the first two years of life. Uh, Amsterdam has the ambition to become a smoke-free city. I think we have to do a lot for that. Uh, it's still 20. Well, actually here it's higher than the national level, uh, uh, especially on young people, among young people and some migrant groups. The ambition of uh, no new HIV infections anymore. Amsterdam wants also be, uh, wants to be an age-friendly city, uh, so especially a city where uh, elderly people are uh, happy uh, to live and are able to live on their own as long as possible, and also focusing on mental health, uh, specifically on loneliness or the prevention of loneliness, uh, depression and anxiety. So many ambitions actually in the local po public health poli policy plan, which is, uh, well, actually uh, health in general is now a hot topic, and that's it's quite... Uh, uh, remarkable, but because it wasn't that uh, for a long time, actually, especially not on the local level. Um, so the approach, just very shortly, um, actually a whole system approach. The city is realizing we can't do it on its own. Uh, maybe we can set some. Uh, 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 yeah, we, we can contribute, but a specific, uh, really not on our on our own. So all relevant partners should be on board. Um, and um, what is important for the city as well uh, to carry out this policy, uh, focus on innovation and uh, creating learning communities. Public-private partnerships are also really uh, supported. Um, 
from the view that uh, uh, the city sees, well, we can't do it on our own. Um, what is important to realize there is that the city says, okay, it should really contribute to our mission. Um, no window dressing, so it should be serious business for uh, the private parties uh, as well. Aligned with the core values uh, of the city and public health care service, so it means also independent and transparent. But also in, over the last year, we have already quite some experience and good cooperation with private parties if it comes to uh, implementing public health programs and scaling them. Um, so this is in short what are the priorities for uh, the local government for the coming four years and I think that very well fits in the theme of this uh, meeting. Thank you so much, Thank you. Arnaud Farouk. And um, if you'd like Arnaud, you can just move on and take one of the three uh, seats. I would like to ask Jaap Sardel as well and uh, Dan Ariely. Yeah, sit in the middle. Should we fight about that? I don't know. <laughs> Good. So we have our experts uh, lined up. Let's, uh, let's get the practitioners in. Uh, the ones who are um, like, well, standing in, the, with their, in, in Dutch, we would say, with their feet in the mud and try to get a business uh, case. Um, in a few moments, I'm going to introduce them to you. Um, we are looking for We've heard a lot. There's a lot of inspiration. And we are looking for, as uh, uh, Marlene said in the beginning, how can we move forward tomorrow? And of course, we will also look to the longer term. But what can these organizations do and maybe start working on tomorrow? Maybe it's small insights or maybe it's big lessons. I don't know. Anything we can look for. I would like to start with Johan de Visser. Please come forward. Johan, yes, an applause, please. You can take your seat. Welcome. Um, and I will also introduce your colleague who will be sitting next to you, and then you can do your little pitch about what you're doing. Johan is the manager of uh, sustain sustainable retailing at Albert Heijn. So that's, uh, are you the biggest supermarket in the Netherlands? Yes, the, market. Uh, the, market the market leader market in leader, the Netherlands yes. for then. Uh, um, and next to you, I would like to introduce to you all Marit Metz. Please come forward. Yes, question mark. Welcome. You are the manager consumer behavior at Question Mark, and we will hear from you in a bit what uh, Question Mark is. I would like to ask Johan first to stand here or stand up or stay seated, whatever you want. Uh, please tell us what you are doing and, well, what these guys or maybe even here in the audience can help you with. Thank you very much. I'm Johan de Visser, and uh, I'm already uh, 30 years in the Albert Heijn Company. Uh, and it's a very uh, lovely company because there is a lot of uh, things to do every, every day. Uh, and at the moment uh, I'm responsible for the healthy eating uh, and I'm, I encourage my uh, uh, colleagues to introduce more healthy options for, uh, for our consumers. Uh, because we are the uh, market leader in the, in the Netherlands and here in the, in the city in Amsterdam we have already 80 stores uh, and it's a big responsibility and we feel that uh, responsibility uh, yeah, very, uh, it, it, it's a very tough thing because every, every day, every week there are 5 million uh, customers we have to serve uh, their plates every, every evening. And how healthy is their, uh, is their plates and how can we help them to make uh, that kind of choices? Uh, and in our health strategy, we have uh, three uh, lines. We, we think about better products, uh, how to make them uh, more healthy, uh, more tasteful. Uh, we think about uh, how uh, can we make the, the healthy choice the easy choice and with more fun. And of course, we are also uh, involved in the communities because we have about a uh, thousand uh, stores and we, we are uh, in, in every uh, village. Uh, we are present in every village, so uh, how can we reach our local customer uh, uh, in, in bringing new ideas? Um, the first thing, uh, I, um, it's about the better products. We reduced for a couple of years uh, the, the amount of salt, uh, fat and sugar. Uh, and the challenge is uh, how to uh, bring it uh, in a tasteful way. Uh, 
results because if you lower the sugar, I did it myself uh, in, in, the, in the dairy, uh, yes, our, uh, consumers um, uh, in favor of that product uh, in, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the next time. Uh, and that's one of the, the challenges for us, how to bring the, the levels of sugar down and the, the salt and the, and, the, and the fat, and how bring it uh, more uh, with ingredients to bring it uh, with a maximum of, of taste. Um, and of course, we bring uh, a lot of new ideas um, uh, to uh, yeah, bring the, the, the healthy choice, the, the easy choice. For instance, um, healthy snacking, to eat more vegetables uh, in between, or um, uh, the, the spaghetti, the salads, uh, and uh, the, uh, it was a winner of the, the Good Food Awards, the, the Paris soups, and of course our uh, healthy packets, fresh packets, how to make you, uh, how, how can you make the, the pumpkin soup, the guacamole and so on. Uh, younger people don't know how to, to, to uh, cook it in a, in a very easy way, and we bring uh, the total packets to them, and yeah, in, in that kind of things we, we can help them. Of course, in the community, uh, we are already 10 years uh, involved in education in uh, the, the other groups, five, six, seven, and eight, to bring uh, ideas for the lunch and uh, in-betweens. Um, and and, and they, they, uh, we give them a lot of uh, food uh, and, uh, to discuss the, the differences. And uh, of course, we have a lot of uh, collaboration with uh, other uh, NGOs. For instance, uh, the JOC, the Jonger op Gezond Gewicht, used for, for a healthy uh, weight. Uh, and we do a lot of uh, activities on, on the local market. And of course, it was already mentioned, uh, mentioned uh, we are also involved in the Amsterdam approach to uh, bring a new example uh, for a healthy lifestyle. Last but not least, our principles, uh, if we uh, are dealing with our customers and we are connected very, uh, very closely with, with them, uh, they, they uh, ask not to uh, force uh, the, the healthy uh, lifestyle, but uh, give inspiration. We have our base in the, in the Netherlands uh, uh, food center, of course, uh, because otherwise everyone has an opinion about healthy food. Um, and uh, we, we said, yes, the customer has to be in control. We want to be uh, uh, transparent with our ingredients and so on. But the big question for us is always, uh, the, the food center is saying, yes, 80% uh, of your food has to be healthy and 20, okay, let's, let's say it's, it's fun to eat uh, chocolate and so on. But the reality is that 60% of the food is unhealthy. Uh, in, in average, and how can we solve that problem together? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, now, I'm, I'm sure many of you have lots of questions or they want to hear what those three guys think about it, but I'm going to ask you to keep that for a couple more minutes so that Marit can probably uh, introduce herself. Marit, you're from Question Mark. Tell us, what do you do and how can we help you? This, this still working? Yes. Sure. Well, question mark is about bringing transparency. Um, we just heard just bringing information is not enough, but bringing information is important. So question mark gathers product data. We enrich this data with uh, information about health and sustainability. Health is an important topic for us, but sustainability is also about ma making better choices. Um, this complex, complex information is not always consumer ready. So we translate this to easy to understand language and to easy to use formats. When we started in 2014, our theory was, okay, we gather data, we enrich this, we share this with the consumer, they can make better choices, change their behavior, create demand for better products, and better products will appear. If only life was so simple. <laughs> so we experimented. First, we built an app, the question mark app. Um, technology is all there. You can use this app. You can go to the supermarket. You scan your product and you see, is this product healthy? Yes, no. Is this product sustainable? Yes, no. Works perfectly. Only, the only thing is, consumers don't go walking around supermarkets scanning products. 
So our next step was trying to get closer to existing consumer behavior. Um, you may, we all make grocery lists, so why not add the information to your grocery list while you're making it? I put, uh, my, I, I'm going to the Albert Heijn, I want to have cereal. Which is the best cereal to take on health? Which is the best cereal to take on sustainability? Click, and I know what to buy. So this worked. Um, and this l offers a lot of opportunities also to make it fun. We talked about fun earlier, to, make, uh, to add gamification, uh, earn badges, make competitions, reduce your fat intake, reduce your salt intake, uh, compete with your friends, all kinds of things. But what we also tried is to, put, to make product rankings. So what we do is we list brands, compare their uh, performance on both health and sustainability, and then put the information out there. So we create a list, a ranking, one, two, say 34 ketchups um, and you can see as a consumer which one performs best which is the worst and what happened companies started calling us the phone rang companies were asking hey why am i on the bottom of the list i didn't know i was doing so much worse than my competitor how can this be how are you measuring this what is the information that you're using what can we do this worked so our theory now is we have data we enrich this data we put it out there, but we put it out there in rankings. So we share it with consumers, we share it with the media, we share it with companies, and now companies are willing to change their products. We also support companies because we're a non-profit and not-for-profit organization. So all this data that we have, we can also use to help products uh, producers to make the products better. So transparency for consumers and reaching hundreds of thousands of consumers per year for us, that's a means to change. So for our short lessons from, from the past couple of years is one, creating new behavior is impossible. For a small organization like Questionmark, we can't do it. Nudging existing behavior, there are opportunities. But putting brands, brand performance in the spotlight, that's an angle that nobody did already and that works for us. So our focus is now to build on uh, brand rankings and also we're working on creating a supermarket ranking. So how are supermarkets performing? And this, this idea is already adopted, adopted by one of the ministries. Um, so we're, um, we're inviting supermarkets also to participate, of course. How well are they performing to uh, seduce and, and uh, make it attractive for consumers to make better choices? So our question today would be, what con existing consumer behavior do you see having this transparency, having this reach of consumers that uh, look up the information, what existing consumer behavior can we use to actually increase the, brand, the, the pressure on brands to change their products? Okay, thank you so much. Marit. <laughs> wow. Um, you guys, uh, I'm sure there's a lot you've heard that you may want to respond to. I'm going to ask you to make a choice and start with your top priority. So you've heard those stories. Mr. Ariely, can I start with you? What, what would you advise or would like to respond to? So, so, so very quickly, I think that the question about the, the supermarket, in the supermarket people make, let's say, 70 choices. The odds that they will make 70 healthy choices is not, is not very high. And even if people fail 30% of the time, it's, it's high. And also, we talked about depletion, this idea that you, you make choices, you make choices, you get exhausted. And the supermarket often tries to tempt us to, to behave with, b better. So one of the things I would, I would recommend that you think about or try is, is to basically get people to not get exposed to the unhealthy choices. So I know you, you want to include those, but imagine that you had... Like imagine we had the cafeteria here, and, and that one was the healthy cafeteria, and this one is the unhealthy cafeteria. And when you come in, you choose which one you go. So imagine you, you go into the Albert Hein, and you have left is the, the floor will be painted red. It's for the people who want to be <laughs> unhealthy. Uh, right is, is in green. You don't and want to be seen there even. You don't probably. want to be seen, so you can use the social pressure. But it's also to, to make life simple, and you just make one decision, and you make it up front. You see, if you walk by the French fries, it's, it's too late. Right? You, you've already been tempted. The question is, how do you not, not get tempted? So, so I would get you to think about reducing the complexity of choices and getting people to choose a basket that is holistically healthy rather than making 70 choices where they could fail on some of them. Okay. For the other, <clears throat> the other thing, 
Um, we, we did a small project. We, we could never uh, get it to scale, but, but we did a project in which we got, um, we taught kids in school about nutrition, and then we sent them to their parents' home, and they made a list of the healthy and unhealthy food in their parents' home, the pantries and the refrigerator. They make two copies. They left one at home, and when one took back to class, and, and they talked about it. And the kids were just pestering the parents. Right? And if you think about kids as agents and change, kids are relentless on, on, on one hand, right? They're incredibly powerful. Um, and, then, and then parents do feel guilty because of their kids. So I, I would try to, I think the shopping list idea is great, but I think if you involve kids in the analysis of what's going on, um, in, in our system, uh, they had this uh, list and they, all, and they marked it with red, green, and yellow about how, how healthy things are. And, and so that was the shopping list? Uh, it was, no, it was not a shopping It was the list of things at home already. Okay. Right, so it was like, what do you have at home? Let's every week revisit what we have home, and that was, um, that was, uh, you know, again, it's, it's a little forceful, like, you know, we talked about the Tamaguchi, like a kid's like pestering <laughs> you at home, it's, it's painful, right? Yeah. It's painful, but I think it could be effective. Okay, so two things, two lanes in the supermarket, uh, or even two departments, <laughs> I'm sorry, and uh, you can, if you use the hand mic, and uh, use the kids, what do you want to respond to, Johan? It, they will switch it on upstairs, yeah. There are very nice ideas. Uh, honestly, it's a little bit like that because uh, we try to start with the, the best healthy food there is in, in the entrance of, of the, the supermarkets and you are free to go. Uh, but honestly, the, the people are going to the, the snacks site uh, as well. Um, th that's one of our uh, uh, issues. Uh, for us, it's... it's uh, the right choice if you you uh, buy the let's say the natural uh, dairy or the, the vegetables or uh, instead of the the sweet dairy it's for us it's the same this so um, we encourage people to to eat more natural uh, dairy uh, because then they, they can add it with with blueberries and so on and walnuts and uh, other uh, healthy stuff but they are also eating chocolates and Afterwards, after the, the, the checkout, we don't know how much they eat from uh, each of that. Uh, when I'm uh, doing research myself and I'm looking at the customers in the checkouts, sometimes I'm, uh, yes, disappointed about all the products on, on, the, on the checkout. Um, and uh, I think that's Maybe the you difficult can think point. Of, uh Something to the cashier. Maybe she can say a little. Do, can she do? Are a you sure? Are you sure you want this? <laughs> <laughs> yes. That maybe we, we can uh, help the cashiers to go back. Put it back. Oh yeah. The scan. <laughs> so, somebody here says, "What if the scanner gives good or bad feedback?" Oh, good. Oh, good. Uh. <laughs> Maybe we can make a television programs of the, yeah. the cashiers <laughs> with all the adventures uh, with the <laughs> Or with products. all those tests. The, yeah. the other thing is the, the program of the children. We like the, the ID. One of the, the big uh, uh, challenges for us is when we uh, educate the, the, the children at school, uh, we, uh, half of the, the, the schools, of, of the amount of the schools are involved in our program. How can we bring it to the families home? Uh, it's not our job. And it's also private, and we are a lot. Uh, we have a lot of discussions with uh, the Missing Chapter Foundation mm -hmm. to help us to bring that uh, kind of thing uh, to the to the families. Okay. Because why, why do you say it's not your job? Uh, it's not our job to to say to force people. I'm I think sure. this is the, the clue eh? for yes. you, for the supermarket. We, we the free will is yeah. very, very, very important, and we heard Dan Ariely say. It should be less. So, so here's here's the question, and and uh, it, it's a, it's a, it's a serious question, right? If if we imagine I came to your home every day uh, with a fresh uh, basket of donuts and croissants, and uh, every day, how many of you would be healthier at the end of the year? Uh, the odds are not very high. We have the. Um, we, can, we can try it. I don't believe you, but we can try it. So, so somebody is eating worse than donuts <laughs> and presents every day. Um, you know, but, but, but here's the thing, right? Uh, as, as a society, we have to admit 
that we have been really good in tempting people. I mean, you're, you're, one, you're one, of, one, of, one of the very many groups of people who live on temptation. And, you know, it's, and, and what, is, what is really our responsibility? On one hand, uh, we give people free access to donuts. Uh, and, and then what do we hope will happen? Right? It's, it's, it's just like, it's, it's like giving people information and say, walk in this field of donuts and just don't eat them. It, it's, it's almost inhumane if you think about the person walking on the street. But what do you do if the people get angry when you take the donuts from them? So, so I, you know, I, I, I don't want to, I, I don't have a solution. I think, I think it's complex. And I think the question of free choice, and I think people should have a small donut from time to time, and, and, and moderation is fine. But, but to say it's not my job, and I'm not really attacking you, I'm attacking the, the industry, but to say it's not my job is to not take full responsibility of the fact that we are creating a house of temptation. Yeah. You go to a supermarket in the US, I'm sure here it's different, most of the stuff is tempt you to misbehave. Now, now that's, a, that's a moral standing. That it's not that you're neutral, you're designing the environment to get people to eat something. There's a, there's a moral, moral standing on this. In the same way that you would say, um, you know, People text and drive. Okay. You can say, we um, just give people phones. It's up to them. No, no, we design phones in a way that we check our phone yeah. all the time and, and messages happen. And the design is very important. Um, I do want to, I mean, I've been doing a lot of these debates and the morality question, I would like to leave outside. Yes. Uh, or uh, it's in here and you've brought yeah. it here and that's good. But I also want to go... Be, Apart from that, mm -hmm. what can we do if we leave yeah. the it's your job or it's your job or it should be the government? Because we, w we won't finish it today. Uh, so what can you do? You can, I, I mean, would Albert Heijn maybe be willing to test? You say when we walk in, we run into the fruit. That's where we start and the veggies. But it sounds good to me. If I can really, really stay away and even if I can keep the kids away from, from some of the... Would you be willing to test it or something? Yes, of course, we test a lot. Uh, we do a lot of uh, uh, storing uh, uh, testing yeah. because we have uh, a lot of managers uh, on, the, on the floor. And one of the, the successes is, is the, the, to introduce the healthy snacking uh, department of, yeah. of uh, healthy, fruit, uh, healthy fruit snacking, of course, it's because it's sweet. But now we have uh, uh, enlarged the, the assortment of vegetable snacking. Yeah. And uh, in Hoofddorp we have uh, experiments with uh, a big uh, shelf only with healthy snacking. Okay. So uh, when you enter, and, uh, enter, uh, enter the, the store... The store, that's you, where you start. That's, that's the start. Okay. Uh, it's an example, and another example, I, I'm proud of it, is in the January, it's always thinking about uh, healthy uh, uh, after the Christmas. <laughs> and we, we start a kickstart, uh, a 10 days experience, eat with us, with Allerhande uh, experts, in a different way. Not a diet, but in a different yeah. way. And people got recipes and every day. Exactly, and, uh, together. And it was very successful. I think next year it's, it's uh, growing bigger and bigger. So it's okay. more, temp uh, no, not temptation, but how, helping, how can you them. helping them to, to make that, that kind of uh, choices. Yap Sedel, what uh, did you want to respond to? Or advice. We, we actually do a lot of this kind of research on how we tempt people to change their behavior and their uh, purchases and things like that. And what the biggest problem is that we are dealing primarily with people with low income, low levels of education, le lo uh, low skills and knowledge about nutrition. Uh, and they think about a lot, but very rarely about sustainability and health. So that's not one of the criteria. They look at price primarily, mm -hmm. convenience because they are pressed with time most of the time, and, st and taste. So, uh, so my question is, so they don't, they don't know enough about health? Is that what you're saying? Because then I realize well, that, well yeah, they know. A, a lot of it is mi mi misconception. So if, if it's called a fruit drink, or if it's called a verantwoordelijk okay. woordje, or you know, cereals for your children, they think you know, automatically this must be good. Because so in terms so on of the knowledge and information, there's still a job to be done. They're being misled by the marketing departments of all of these uh, okay. food companies. And, um, um, but also lack of skills, you know, cooking. Uh, 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 prepare preparation. Uh, uh, they all think that convenience and time are something that are abso absolutely necessary in their busy lives. 
uh, and it should cost le as little as possible. Yep. So we should also incorporate, I think, and maybe you're doing that in question mark also, to give alternatives that have the same convenience, the same price and the same taste, or uh, at least reasonable alternatives, because otherwise, if you have to choose between you know, yep. completely different foods in terms of sustainability and health, if, 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 you know, vegetables instead of meats or something like that, that yep. that's not really a choice. Okay. Uh, so to help people to guide that choice, we need other dimensions to take into account also. And, and, for, uh, and I agree with, completely with Dan Ariely here that, that actually one of the recommendations that was up there and which is also from the World Health Organization, we should set standards for food environments in different settings. Not maybe the supermarket, but clearly at schools, hospitals, uh, care institutions yep. and uh, government buildings, etc. And it's, it's happening, it's, isn't it? It's happening slowly. Uh, but it could uh, go much faster. I mean, I get sent uh, pictures of school canteens and um, vending machines and things like that almost every day. You know, it's te terrible, it's lousy, Still nobody wants to change and things like that. So it can be go more, much more rapidly. And I think government should set standards there. Okay. I, uh, yeah. I want to, um, two, two comments about this. So one is that there are, some, there are some food that people are confused over. So, for example, in the U.S., muffins. You know, people used to think that muffin is breakfast food, and then they learned it's just cake. So, you know, there's some things that, that people get confused with, but a lot of things we know. We know fruit in general, we know vegetable, we know donuts. Um, th there's another question of how do we label food? So we've been doing some experiments about food labeling. Um, actually, one of the nicest results, uh, not, not ours, but showing that if you label the food by how many minutes you need to run to make up for it, it has a bigger effect. And, and the reason, by the way, is that it's not because it's more informative, but it gives you an action plan for today. So you basically say, oh, this, this cake is 75 minutes of running, and you say, I can't do it today. Or yeah. even if it's 20, but it changes your scale from thinking about, oh, it's just calories, okay. to say, can I so do th this that today? that could be something maybe yeah. for Maritz yeah, to that, add to the Yeah, let me, let me just finish this. So, so we, we, we found that this works very well. We did another system which says just green and red. Green healthy, red unhealthy in the middle, lots of stuff we will not label. And we tried to get the Israeli government to, to adopt those. And we really wanted them to adopt the meaning of running, but the, the minutes of running, they, they just couldn't stomach it. They, they just said, even though the research supported it, the, the guy who runs the Ministry of Health said, I can't propose it. The ministers will just make too much fun of me. So, <laughs> um, so we ended up with the green and red, and they just passed it in, in Parliament, and, and next year it will, come, it will come into effect. But much like your example, the, the food company, even though it will take a year and a couple of months before it, it's in effect, the food company is already stressing out on this, and everybody is reformulating. So sometimes you just need to create fear uh, yeah, to which get, is what, to get uh, food to question move mark forward. Arnold Fouf, what would you like to respond to? Well, I think, like uh, I said before, that for the point of view of the city, we, the, the healthy choice should be the easy choice. And, well, we, we cooperated with Albert Heijn with some of the experiments, uh, which is indeed interesting uh, to see. But I think the app you have, uh, I think what would be very nice if uh, you could also include some way or another um, uh, cultural and, uh, and diversity in it. We, we see here in our population, of course, it's very uh, diverse in many uh, aspects and uh, especially if it comes to to food and food culture and how important uh, eating is or not and how how different cultures are, are, are dealing with that and that's one of the challenges we have here in the city that uh, there is no one uh, no solution fits all uh, and that's with most of the apps as well and uh, so it would be very nice if you could also take that into account but how could you what, reach what would it look like because well, I think, like, if you see, for, uh, for example, the uh, African population here in Amsterdam or the uh, uh, Surinamese population, they have the totally different diets. Yeah. So they also go to other shops, and uh, so it, it, it should give the oh, possibility, okay. the same as the food center. So the center. products in those different shops should also be part of it. Yeah, like, like most of the information of the Dutch food center, it's not applicable for yep. them. Uh, so, and okay. we see most of the problems uh, the prevalence of overweight, uh, unhealthy behavior is primarily okay. among them. So, okay. 
that would be uh, very nice if you could extend it. That's, that's true. The only thing is that we uh, get our data from uh, it's supermarket products that we have the data from. So, Marit, uh, can you put it a little bit closer, the mic? Yeah. Yeah. So we use supermarket data. Um, so we would need to find ways to include other shops. But I mean, yeah, could, could be. Yeah. Used. We have a little technical problem, but you'll solve it. I, I want to tell you about one, one other uh, project that we started doing, which I think has some promise. So we thought that uh, when people overconsume, right? From time to time, we overconsume. Like we have a good weekend and you know, things happen and we drink too much and eat too much. And we thought about that, that mostly when this happens, we have a model of borrowing money from a bank. You know, we had this serious weekend, we borrowed some calories and now we need to return. And that's one model. And in the US, the, the pattern of weight gain that we see is people basically gain about four pounds at the end of the year. Thanksgiving and Christmas, and then they never lose it. So we you see this small, small increase. I mean, there's all other things as well, but we, we see that pattern happening very much. I don't know if it's the same, it's the same here. And, and people have plans, right? They say, oh, this is November and December. I know I'm going to gain four pounds, but in January, I'll, I'll return that to the bank. And of course, they never do. So we thought, what if we move to a system where we ask people to save rather than to uh, borrow? So we said to people, what, what if you, you want to party next weekend? Save for the next two weeks. And what we found is that when people borrow, if we had a crazy weekend, they return a maximum 70% of the calories. Right? So you ate an extra 2,000 calories on the weekend. You try to constrain yourself a little bit the days after, and you, and you eat not 2,000 calories less, maybe 1,400 calories, right? So you, 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 say, you, you gave back a little bit. But if you save, if you say, okay, in these two weeks I'm going to work up for it, I'll create a bank, and you created a bank for 2,000 calories, now people don't want to spend the 2,000 calories, right? They say, oh, it was so much work <laughs> to get this, <clears throat> and they only spend a small proportion of it, right? About 60% of it. So, so I think another thing to do is to basically get people to create a calorie bank. And I think you, you, you can actually think about how to, how to do that, is, is to get people, when we give up calories, to give us credit for it and allow us to, ch to, you know, to, to check it later, but okay. not to rely on people's crazy mental accounting <laughs> of, uh, Yo, you know, I ate too much, but I've returned it oh, two weeks already, and, and so on, make it a bit more... Explicit, it might, okay. might be Okay, I'm going to see if there's anybody here in the audience that wants to maybe give some advice or put a question. I see a couple of hands. I start here. Sorry. So, what's your name? I'm Casper uh, van Olden. Uh, I had actually two questions, but maybe I can... Maybe one. one. <laughs> maybe one, all right. Then I'll, I'll ask Dan a question. Um, in the middle of your talk, you said about people having, uh, being exhausted of making choices. And you offer a solution that we should train them that actually they don't have to make a choice, but it becomes a habit to uh, live healthily. But I was wondering, then you never stop. It will, where does it end? You have to do it with gaming, with, with smoking, with cars, seat belts, etc. I was wondering, wouldn't it be a better way to see if you can teach people and learn them to be better at prioritizing their health and start trying to make informed decisions when they are not yet exhausted by making these choices. So, so in principle, you're right, just that human nature doesn't fit uh, that, that aspect. So look, it, it's not that I'm happy to say, let's not teach people uh, stuff. And, uh, but, but the reality is that if, if you basically think about every decision, you'll get things wrong. So think about texting and driving. That's a very simple uh, behavior, and you know, in Holland also cycling and, and texting. Um, you know, if you think about that behavior, it's very simple. One bad mistake can kill you, right? It's just not enough to get people to stop doing it, right? And there's also this stochastic element because sometimes you text and drive and nothing happens, right? So you say, oh, maybe it's not so bad. The same thing with food. Sometimes you have a crazy weekend and you don't gain weight the next day. So oh, maybe it's okay. So, so we have, we're dealing with a very, very complex dynamic system that doesn't punish and reward people very quickly. So the chances of learning and using the right intuition and so on is just not there. And, and the world is becoming very complex. The world is becoming very complex. Um, 
so, so if you think the world is becoming very complex, lots of types of food, feedback is delayed, you don't really understand what is going on, what, what can we do? Can we train people with everything? The answer is no. Can we give people rule of thumb? Yes. Can we try to create habits? Yes. Can we try to create religious rules? You know, people, people, you know, they joke, how do you know that somebody is a, a vegan? They tell you. <laughs> so, you know, but if you think about being, being a, a, a vegan or vegetarian, it's a rule. But, but, you know, it's very hard to say, I eat meat only once every two weeks. How do you count? How do you remember? I mean, it's great to do that. So you say, no, I'll never eat it, because if I never eat it, now it's easy. It's mm -hmm. easy to count, to remember, to get motivated, and so on. So it, I wish this was not the case. But it is. But it's the easiest way to get behavior to get okay. better. I've got another question here. Who are you? Hi, I'm Mos. Uh, i got a question. I'm I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> OK, Mose. hi, Mos. Hi. Uh, I have a question for, I think, uh, also Dan, but also Jaap. Uh, are we not maybe uh, avoiding the big elephant in the room? So we talked about a, a big group is actually in more the, the lower class, basically, uh, and these guys are poor. We also talked about financial stressors. So I was wondering if we would uh, eliminate or, or alleviate basically the financial stressors in this group, how much of this healthy problem would we actually solve and are we done that to Two birds, one stone. Okay. And then we won't ask the question how to get no. them less poor, because that's going to be another... Okay, another no, well, we'll skip know, that yeah, one. Because yeah. all the time we've been talking about really cognitive decisions, right? About information, about co counting calories, and about all, doing all kinds of, uh, well, very sophisticated things. Uh, in, in the people that we, uh, people, uh, the populations that we study, none of this will work. Because they are just surviving on a daily basis. There's food insecurity, there's job insecurity, there's financial stresses and all kinds of other things. What do we know about chronic stress is that people make poor long-term decisions. They only make short-term decisions. Uh, and um, stress is actually causing sleep deprivation. Sleep deprivation is causing snacking behaviors and, and, and uh, uh, lack of physical activity and all kinds of other things. So all of this is part of this inequality problem uh, that people that are um, Dealing with stress on a daily basis, like food insecurity and uh, uh, financial stresses, uh, they cannot plan ahead and they cannot do the cognitive things that we uh, now are talking about. So helping them with this stress relief is one of the clear first things that we need to do. It's also part of the Amsterdam approach to, health, to healthier habits in, in the city. Uh, and it reduces health inequality, giving people more education, giving them more chances in life, having less financial stresses, etc., things like that. Then they can start and plan ahead. You know, so part of part of what we are what we've been doing studies in the food banks, for instance, and um, we thought you know we were doing a good thing because it's qu quite a lot of crappy foods in the food bank system because it's donated by PepsiCo and all these other companies, uh, and so we decided to take those out and give them fresh vegetables and fruits. That was not appreciated because they needed the, 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 the sugar, the cookies and the, and the fats for comfort food. You know, that's, that's what their uh, taste and, and uh, satisfaction and all kinds of other things. And actually they didn't know what to do with the vegetables, so they threw them away. So, you know, we have to really deal with these, uh, with, with people under circumstances. And this, this is what I've been talking about, why I talked about social determinants of health. If we don't take care of the social determinants of behavior and health, then we are not going to solve it with all kinds of sophisticated uh, apps okay. and all kinds of other things. I think you should ask Albert Heijn for the soup and the veggie uh, uh, packets because they are teaching people again how to make proper soup or vegetable uh, uh, menus. Yeah, but then you're already ready to do all of this because yeah, the then it's the time again and the lack of convenience. Health. Okay. Yeah. But just just to be clear, uh, the, the very poor life is incredibly complex for them, and they take a big part of the health bucket. But it's not limited to that, right? So so there is lots of improvement across the across the scale. Um, uh, one one other thing that we we are working on is. Uh, we basically kind of, because I believe in technology, right? We all believe in technology, right? If you, um, Marlene said that, you know, we will need a million 
a billion doctors. If, if we wanted just to deal with everybody one by one, what, what do we do? Uh, so a couple of years ago, actually four years ago, we said, how do we get people to eat the right portion? By the way, portion is a, we haven't talked about portion, but that's a big part of it is that even when people eat healthy, they eat too much. So we said, how do we get people to eat the right portion and healthy food? And we started thinking about all kinds of um, ways to do it, and we came up with a little machine that looks like an espresso machine uh, that cooks food. And uh, you put a capsule in it, and in, in one minute to two minutes, depending on what you cook, you have a healthy meal that uh, has no preservatives, no additives, um, healthy, almost no oil, depending on, on what it is. And, and there could be all kinds of things. And, and the conditions, and, and the thing we said from the beginning was, it has to be less than two minutes. It has to be something that people can store at home. It needs to be available. Uh, and right now we're, we're, uh, we're piloting it with the Israeli army because you know, soldiers really beat up machines. Uh, you know, they, they, they are cruel people. I mean, you know, they, they're not cruel to this, but they, you know, they treat equipment in a very bad way. So it's a really good way to testing. But I think those are the kind of things that we need. So if you say, let's rely on people to go to the supermarket every, you know, two, twice a week, you, we're limiting our population. We need to really rethink the, the package food industry in a very different way if we want to help the, the low tail of the income okay. distribution. I'm having a little problem here because officially uh, you guys should start drinking water, probably. Um, but there's a lot of, there's a couple of questions left. Um, yeah, yeah, you really want it. How about you? On a scale of one to ten, how, how eager are you to put your, to pose your question? And you are too. So who's the most elegant here? Okay, thank you so much. All, a big applause for this lady here. <laughs> What's your name? Maru. Maru, what do you want to ask? Why is it only surnames in this corner? Is it only here? <laughs> well, uh, first names, yeah. First names, yes. Well, thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> I have a question from you, Mister. Like um, we're talking about uh, the supermarket, Johan. Uh, yeah. Johan, yeah. Um, as entrepreneur, I think if we want to help people, you're um, in the need to give up something. For example, I know the restructure of the supermarket into green area and red area would imply a logistic problem, probably more investment. How willing are you to reduce the earnings probably to be able to help the people? And I'm going to put that question back to you because we said we were going to find a business model. And finding a business model is not about reducing earnings. No. It's about reducing costs. So do you have a suggestion on how to deal with that? Well, I think um, it, food needs to be more um, attractive. So for me, the, the challenge as a supermarket, as an entrepreneur, is how can we make the food uh, healthy and attractive? So the healthy food pleasurable, so that the health can be a temptation. OK. And maybe can, you I, want... can I make a suggestion yeah, on how you sure. make it profitable? <laughs> So I told you a little bit about Discovery Health, this company in South Africa. So we did an experiment with them. So, so in general, if you're a member of Discovery, you get 20% discount on your healthy food. We wrote everybody, not everybody, we took a sample of people, we wrote them a letter, and we said, look, last month, your proportion of healthy food in your basket was, let's say, 12%. And we say, would you like to join a program that if you increase it by 5%, from 12 to 17 you'll get to keep your discount, and if you don't increase it to 17, you will lose your discount. Now, this doesn't sound like a good deal, right? Because you could just keep your discount. But guess what? 30% of the people took us on this deal. You know, it's not 100, but 30% of the people say, yes, I want a little whip that would cause me to, 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 to buy healthier things. I want something that would help me force myself to do that. And then we ran the program for six months, and all of them, all of the people that sign up failed on one of those six months. Nobody managed to do it all six months, and they all lost money. But even when they lost money, they didn't want to get out of that program. So at the end of the day, Discovery made tens of thousands of dollars by not giving people refunds. <laughs> I'm not recommending, but you know, people are willing to pay money. I mean, we at Duke, we had something called the rice diet, where people would pay lots of money to be locked in a room with nothing but rice. 
you could eat rice at free, almost at, for free at home, but you'll know you'll not do it. So I think supermarkets, now this is not the low income, but I think we can create a little, little programs where people would put money on themselves to force themselves to behave, to behave better, because all of us wants to eat, want to eat better. And some of us are willing to put some money to increase the stakes and get us to, to do that. So I don't, think, I don't think it has to cost money. I'm not saying you know, abuse people and charge them for well, this thing. But I think there are plans there's sports like that. There's, uh, uh, Weight Watchers. There's, there's gyms there's where you yeah. have to pay where you don't show up. And people do that voluntarily. I, okay, I want to give all of you... Yeah, of course you can respond to this. Yeah. yeah I like the idea of the gamification uh, to, to encourage the people to make uh, games with each other, with families together. Uh, and uh, in, on the, on the uh, store floor, we enlarge our uh, assortments of uh, he healthy food, uh, like the vegetables, also the natural dairies, uh, the cereals. Uh, yeah. Next week, uh, we have a, a lot of uh, very nice uh, new, new uh, cereals. So, um, uh, okay, we'll all run to the store. Do. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. I want to give you all the opportunity to, to uh, finish this off with maybe two or three sentences on. Um, we've heard a little bit of what we can do and what we should do, but where do you think we will actually be in five years' time? What will we have done? Because it is easy enough. Yap Seidel. Yeah, I, I think we have to remind ourselves that we make 200 food decisions on a day, yeah. and about 90% of them are automatic, involuntary. They're just, you know, we just do it because it's there. I'm drinking water because it's here. Yeah. If it would have been orange juice, I would be drinking orange juice. That's, this is how uh, the food environment is dictating our lives. Two or three sentences. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> that was one sentence. <laughs> You're the first one, so they will all do it, <laughs> and then I have no, a problem. No, so we have to really create a different food environment. So uh, not rely on choices and yeah. cognitive. And we are uh, working on it. And what will we, be what will be different in well, five years' the time? Well, the difference need to be we need to take out the temptations. Okay. This is what we need to do. And we will have done that in five years' time. Is it happening? In many places we will. Okay, yeah. thank you so much. So this is also about incentives. If the first one takes 10 sentences, then the rest will. I'm going to ask you then, can you try to finish it off in two or three sentences? No. No. <laughs> That's also good, thanks. <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to say, but I'm offering you four or five. No, no? Three? No. Okay. I, I, I second my uh, comrade here on the right. Yeah, we will make some steps. Arnaud. Yeah, just to emphasize that we made already a difference, for example, at the school environments. Yep. Nowadays, water, just tap water, is the main thing to drink. And, and it's also five what they years drink. ago, that was not the case at all. So but do we, they run out to the supermarket? To, no, they take the in water In the beginning, out. they did. Yeah. Parents were just, when they uh, got their kids, yep. were having the, all the, the sweet drinks, okay. etc. But that changed now. So that Next gives step? some... And the next step, we did we'll the school. We'll other steps in the food environment as well. Okay. Johan? Yeah, we can uh, bring, of course, very uh, uh, exciting new uh, healthy products yeah. in, the, in the next years. And also we can bring insights in the uh, buying uh, behaviors okay. of the products. Okay. And are you going to share that with Marit, maybe? And then she can use the data to put it in the app. No, Marit, what's, where, where will you be in five years' time? Will we be in five years' time? Well, that's a good question. Uh, what I was, what I was, uh, what I wanted to say is actually that I think there's a there's a there's a positive wave. Like there's a um, many uh, parties are working for the same uh, goals. So what we need to do is to uh, find a common interest um, and then work together um, because everybody, every institution, every uh, company, uh, university, everybody has its own role. So we need to find ways to bundle all that in, uh, energy. And it's going to happen and, in the um, coming five years. We're working years. on it. It's already happening. I okay. Think. Thank you so much. Can I have a big applause, please, for our guests? Thank you so much. Dan Arioli, Jack Seidel, Anna Kuhn, Johan de Fischer, and Marek Nitz. And I'm um, looking to our, our host, actually, for today, uh, Marlene Hendricks. Are you happy? Is it time to go and have a drink? Okay. I, will hope, to, I hope to see you all at the bar then. Okay, thank you so much for coming.